episode of the Cobra News. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting stories for you today. Uh, but before we dive in, um, I do want to let you know, obviously, you know, if you're catching this on the YouTube, do like the video. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. Do hit that bell, uh, the little notification bell that does really help out. Um, I don't understand how it helps out, but apparently it does. So do that. Leave a comment if you have any questions. Uh, if you're catching this live on the Discord, um, welcome, guys. Glad to, glad to see everybody in the room. Um, I want to start things off with uh, the World Economic Forum, right? WEF um, 2022. Blockchain community breaks stereotypes at, at Davos. Ezra uh, Regera is bringing us this, uh, this sauce from six hours ago. Let me just update that. It's probably a little bit more than six hours now apparently not it's still certified fresh fantastic um so soramitsu ceo makoto takemiya uh described the blockchain companies as the quote unquote barbarians at the gate storming the world economic forum um let's take a look so on the second day of the global blockchain business council's uh blockchain central davos uh 2022 coin telegraph's editor-in-chief christina lucrezia corner uh moderated a panel discussion uh focusing on the current direction of the financial industry uh everybody getting into a room kind of seeing what's what and where it's going type thing um the panelists included the co-founder and ceo of uh soramitsu uh, makoto takemiya uh treasury executive at uh osterreichish national bank i butchered that uh if you know how it's supposed to be pronounced do leave a comment teach me because i don't know um johan duong and, and, and Chief Operating of, uh, Officer, COO of the Stellar Development Foundation, uh, Jason Shilpala, was also uh, in attendance. Now, this panel tackled various issues. They talked about educating the mainstream about blockchain. We know how important that is with, uh, you know, with mass adoption. Uh, they talked about how blockchain companies are breaking stereotypes, right? And we'll get into what those stereotypes are in just a second. Um, they also talked about current market issues surrounding central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. Uh, and stable coins. So effectively, you know, they, they talked about the state of mass adoption, really, uh, is what they talked about, because because these are all things that we have kind of covered in the grand um, conversation about um, mass adoption, isn't it? You know, regulation is something. This is what we see in the UK. They, it starts with stable coins, you know, regulation of the space. First, it's recognition, then it's uh, regulation. Um, and then whatever comes after that. But regulation is definitely, you know, in, in moderation, it's a good thing. So they've talked about the current state of, of, of where blockchain technology is, um, the stereotypes themselves, probably um, all, the, all the scammy sort of perception uh, that the word crypto has started to kind of take on. Uh, but this is why, you know, DeFi, uh, if you were on uh, this stream live, uh, you would have seen the education uh, sort of segment um, if you're on the YouTube, do go through our playlists and check out the What is DeFi uh, education segment. It should be episode something, a number. Um, it should be an episode. So do go check that out um, because I feel like the distinction between crypto and DeFi is quite important. Uh, and now that we see, you know, with all these stories we're going to cover up here, uh, what you're going to see is more and more mass adoption. You're going to see more mass adoption, not of crypto and all of the uh, negativity that's associated with that word. Um, but but mass adoption of DeFi, mass adoption of decentralized finance, the decentralization of finance and everything that that entails, all of the freedoms, all of the um, distribution of, of power, um, of access, right? All of that um, is entailed within the term, the umbrella term DeFi, uh, which is nice, which is good. Now, the common perception of the World Economic Forum, this this big circle of, of ants, this is exactly, I can verify that this is exactly what it looks like. This is what those guys look like, and this is what the room looked like. Um, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, obviously. Um, but the perception is that it's a gathering of, of uh, industry bigwigs, magnets, financial elites. Um, but this year... Uh, things things have been a little bit uh, a little bit different, you know. They they called they called us uh, barbarians, the blockchain folk, right? The blockchain people. Uh, the barbarians stormed the gate, stormed in, pitchforks in hand, torches and pitchforks. Uh, according to Takamiya, blockchain companies have broken the stereotype, right? He explains that uh, the stereotype of the WEF is the entrenched financial elite that is looking to preserve their wealth. Uh, that may or may not be true, but that is the perception, is what he says. 
uh, blockchain companies are uh, the barbarians in that case. Now, if, if the barbarian is, what he's effectively saying is that they are the opposite of the entrenched financial elite that is looking to preserve their wealth, isn't it? The barbarians that are storming the gates of the castle, um, of the fiefdom, um, trying, to, trying to pull down the fiefdom. Um, so yeah, what, what does that mean? Preservation? What's the opposite of that? Distribution, right? Uh, you preserve, you, ha you, you, you accumulate and hold on to your wealth and try to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, or you distribute access to knowledge, access to technology, access to financial or, or technological systems um, that, that lead to financial freedom, true, true financial freedom. Um, apart from having a voice at one of the biggest gatherings of the financial industry, the panel also discussed the community's efforts on educating the masses on cryptocurrencies and blockchain. I'd say we at the Crypto Cobras know a little bit about educating the masses on cryptocurrencies and blockchain, uh, but Duong also weighed in on the topic. According to him, there's a lot of educational concerns in Austria. Uh, however, there are also efforts from universities to teach uh, about blockchain and crypto, but let's say blockchain and DeFi because we don't like that word. Um, he said that we have universities providing courses for blockchain assets. Um, and we are trying to see it from a neutral position. That's a bit telling. Trying. The fact that you have to try to look at something neutrally <laughs> is a little bit telling. Um, this right here is um, a picture of what the panelists kind of looked like. This is what the, what the room was. I feel like the initial picture, like I said, you know, a little bit misleading. This is what they actually look like. This is what the ants are. Some faces to the names, right? Um, among the topics discussed, current market issues such as CBDCs and stablecoins have also surfaced. Um, centralized bank digital currencies, stablecoins are um, basically pegged against something that is stable, uh, and that gives it stability. It's a, it's a, a cryptocurrency or, or a token on a blockchain um, that is effectively pegged to something else. Um, Chlapala compared the um, launch of Libra, later renamed DM, uh, and its impact on the conversation around CBDCs with the current situation of Terra. Uh, if you guys are not aware of this, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you are aware of this now, uh, but this was a big, big situation that happened earlier. Um, Terra's stablecoin, uh, an algorithmic stablecoin, it, it kind of crashed and burned. <laughs> and uh, it got to the point where Doquan, the creator of it, literally posted a burn address on uh, Twitter and said, hey, like, uh, hashtag lunatics, don't use it, though. Um, it was it was just a, it was just a bit of a mess uh, that whole situation. Uh, we did obviously cover it um, because it was a part of the news, and we explained. Um, I think we went into uh, algorithmic stablecoins as well, or or just stablecoins in general. So you know, go through all of the YouTube videos. You will find that content, um, and it'll inform. You know, we always focus on context and informing uh, people's knowledge um, around things, right? So go get yourself that extra context because that content does exist um, and it's really going to help you understand um, and take in uh, everything that's happening in the world of DeFi. Um, so yeah, they talked about Terra and, and how it would affect discussions surrounding stablecoins. I did cover kind of touch on it as well. I don't personally think an algorithmic stablecoin is a bad thing uh, if it's done well uh, and if it's not tampered with. Um, an algorithmic stablecoin is uh, more in line with absolute true pure uh decentralization of power within this within the realms of finance right um that's that's what it pushes for um so i'm still i'm still bullish on that you know we need to go through um sort of failures stumbles to kind of figure out how to implement something correctly uh with that said i mean obviously it does suck that a lot of people lost a lot of money um, but then again, you know, there's something to learn there. Risk management, diversification of your portfolio, all things that we've covered in the past. So go through um, <laughs> all of our previous content. I'm sure you'll find something um, of value there. This could be the impetus, this discussion, these, these, the fact that these topics are being discussed at this forum, uh, the World Economic Forum, which, like the guy said, is historically, um, you know, entrenched financial elites. Uh, the fact that all of this is being discussed, you know, CBDCs, education around DeFi, uh, the decentralization of power and finance and stuff like that. Um, they're viewing it as the impetus for really starting to get some regulatory clarity uh, and some business clarity, which I also agree with him. He thinks leads to trust. Uh, clarity is the most important thing, man. Like, honestly, with regulation, 
um, in moderation, right? But but the thing is, you won't have to worry about, hey, is the government just going to use this as step one and then get their oily little fingers into the into the pie and just try to like r wrestle control away from the people once again? Um, you won't have to worry about those questions if the if the sort of roadmap, <laughs> right? Treat it like an NFT project. If the roadmap is strong and the roadmap is more importantly on the website and there for people to look at, um, what does that build? It builds trust, it builds, it's clarity that builds trust, which builds more investment into the idea or the phenomenon, uh, more people buy into it. And that's how something gets its legs. That's how mass adoption, true mass adoption happens. And when that finally happens, that's when we're gonna see what blockchain technology is truly capable of that's when we're gonna see the um true sort of scope of blockchain technology being implemented into human life we're gonna talk about genes uh like people manipulating genes and stuff genomics companies exploring nfts in hopes of advancing all of that that nonsense right so that's a whole not nonsense but you know what i mean like it's a lot there's so much scope to this technology and it's only when we have true mass adoption that we will fully understand just how critical an innovation in human existence this blockchain stuff really, really is. Um, so to, to wrap up this article, um, meanwhile, it says in an article, uh, in an interview, excuse me, with Cointelegraph, Sheila Warren, uh, who is the CEO of the Crypto uh, Council for Innovation, shared that despite the negativity surrounding the market she remains optimistic and she believes in the future of blockchain and of crypto um i don't like that word the future of blockchain and of decentralized finance that is literally honestly sheila you're right on the money i'm i'm, I'm with that i'm cautiously optimistic about everything <laughs> generally but um yeah definitely definitely bullish I, I would say all these crashes and burns and mild setbacks all they are is it's like a market right it's a little pullback a little reversal before the big pump um that's that's all i see it as uh similarly the senior vice president for uh ripple uh brooks and whistle also encouraged people to focus on building despite what seems to be a crypto winter the ripple executive said that this has happened before and it's likely to happen again i agree with the ripple executive and that's that on the world economic forum do let us know what you think about this in the comments below uh, because it is really, really interesting. Do you think that this is a step forward in um, crypto mass adoption, DeFi mass adoption? I mean, clearly, to me, it seems like it is. Uh, but maybe you see something I don't. You know, put put something in the in the comments if you feel like this is a detractionary sort of piece of news uh, for whatever reason. I'd be I'd be more than interested to kind of uh, hear that opinion. You know. Now. I, I'd say let's move away from uh, the World Economic Forum, <laughs> right? And let's revisit the Central African Republic. We did look at this uh, on a news episode before. Um, we talked about mass adoption in Ecuador, in Panama, and in the Central African uh, Republic. So these guys, kind of like Ecuador, um, what they did was they, they kind of legalized um, crypto, like Bitcoin. Literally, Bitcoin is legal tender now in the Central African Republic. Um, so let's go through the news from Helen um, again six hours ago. I'm not gonna shoot myself in the foot and reload it Actually, no, I am. What am I saying? I'm Dharma. Of course, I'm gonna do that um, Six hours. Yay. Fantastic bullets in my feet right now. That's great um, The Central African Republic to launch official crypto hub Sango is what it's called. So the CAR prepares to launch its first major crypto hub uh, pretty soon after the National Assembly uh, accepted or adopted Bitcoin uh, as legal tender uh, within the Republic. So shortly after approving BTC as legal tender, uh, the local government of the CAR is now moving to provide um, infrastructure for this digital currency. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. They're taking the right step. To Adera, uh took to Twitter on Tuesday to announce the upcoming launch of the country's first major crypto initiative, dubbed Sango. The creation of the CAR's crypto hub comes soon after the National Assembly unanimously adopted Bitcoin as legal tender, uh, noted the uh, CAR president. This is uh, literally direct from Twitter following the unanimous uh, adoption by the National Assembly of BTC. We are pleased to showcase the first concrete initiative. It goes beyond politics and administration and has the potential to reshape um, 
the Central African Republic's financial system. I love it. I love it. This is Sango.org. Let's take a look at what it looks like. The crypto initiative. Cool. Bit bare bones, the website itself, but uh, wait list or contribute. Awesome. So it's there. This is the main thing, though. You know, you can't um, just accept something as, as legal tender and then just not do the work to kind of hold that water. You know, you can strike water, uh, but you need to be able to hold that water, too. So it seems like these guys are taking the right steps. First, they legalize it, right, or, or accept it as tender. Um, and then what do they do? They create immediately, very shortly after uh, a unanimous adoption, they begin building what uh, the president calls concrete initiatives. Very bullish. I love it. Um, the president previously introduced the Sango project as the legal cryptocurrency investment platform on the government's official Facebook page on Tuesday. Uh, the Sango platform is positioned as CAR's quote-unquote first crypto initiative uh, and is called the name of uh, the car's second official language after french interesting okay i was wondering what sango meant uh so it's french and then sango okay cool 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 um the platform was initiated by the national assembly and is supported by the car government and the president so it's um government entity right behind uh this exchange this whole this whole uh this infrastructure um, but, you know, I feel like this is a step in the right direction. They've done it the right way, uh, effectively. But let's go through, let's go through the article. Um, the construction of the first legal crypto hub in the heart of Africa will improve crypto experience by taking Bitcoin adoption to the next level. Hell yeah. Um, potentially bringing the most unconventional space, uh, in the world. This is what the presidential, uh, statement read. Uh, Tuadera pointed out that the adoption of Bitcoin provides quote-unquote unimaginable possibilities, yes it does, uh, for the country's development and transformation, stating uh, the crypto hub, Bitcoin, and crypto are the tools that will redesign the future of our country. Sango can usher in a new economic era with enormous potential which neither Africa nor the rest of the world have imagined. He's not wrong. He's, he's really not wrong. I mean, it depends on how they handle this, but it seems like they're taking the right steps um, to start with. And it's literally, like I said, we need to we need to reach uh, the end goal of 100% mass adoption uh, in order to truly see what all of this technology can do for us as a species, right? Uh, and it seems like the president of the Central African Republic is is truly, like his head's in the right place. It seems like he has a DeFi view on things. Um, big picture, right? Big picture. It's literally like, um, it's literally like Sheila, Sheila Warren said, right? Uh, despite the negativity, the negativity surrounding the market, um, the future of blockchain is what keeps the bullish, uh, sentiment alive, right? Not even bullishness, it's just kind of realistic, you know? You just take a stock for the world, extrapolate, um, what could be based off of, uh, what has been or what, what the, what the... And when I say what has been, I don't mean the kind of recent history of Bitcoin. I mean the spread of human history and the way that new technologies have been introduced, held back from the people, slowly phased in. And then, you know, think about the the motor car. Think about the Internet. Think about just literally anything, man. Any big <laughs> technological innovation. It follows the same kind of cycle. And Bitcoin is going to do the same thing. Um, but it's that's why it's so key that we push this education angle um, and give people the tools, empower the people to understand this space and, and make moves within this space because it's really, really important. Um, I was talking to Z uh, earlier today and, and he was saying we need like 10, 15 million more people in this space and it'll be fine. And I said, imagine 10, 20 million people, but they're all fully educated DeFi people. Can you imagine that? Like the power um, <laughs> of, of community, the power of educated people. Um, it's insane. It's crazy. And and we can do our part to make that beautiful reality much more of a tangible reality um, by educating ourselves and helping to educate other people um, about crypto, about DeFi, about DeFi philosophy, about the future um, applications of this technology. Um, so, yeah, yeah, 100% very, very happy with the story. It's It's given me a lot more bullish energy. Um, the president also said that his greatest wish is that the Sango project makes crypto accessible to all. Yes, Mr. Tuadera, man after my own heart. I love this. 
um, creating an international case uh, for how crypto benefits become vectors of economic performance in the country. The formal economy is no longer an option, says the president, uh, adding that new platforms like Sango aim to tackle bureaucracy. And honestly, yeah, if you really think about, the, the, think about it, the way things stand right now, really not an option if you want to build a country up, develop a, 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 a business or yourself into success. It's very, very difficult now. Extremely difficult. And why? Why? Literally because. Entrenchment. That's what it is. Entrenchment. It's like the ice cream machine at McDonald's, right? It's gonna, it's gonna run really, really nice and the ice cream's gonna come out real nice on day one. But five years down the line, bro, like there's a reason the ice cream machine never works. It's because you open that bitch up, it's, it's disgusting in there, right? It's all this muck that's, that's caused by entrenchment because it's years upon years of all this nonsense flowing through the machine um, and this gunk just collects, right? And it makes the system really, really difficult. It makes the system not work the way that it should. Um, so he has a really, really good point. He has a really, really good point. It's not an option anymore. Um, and platforms like Sango are what's going to tackle bureaucracy um, and promote competition. The CAR has become the first country in Africa to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender and the second in the world to do so after El Salvador. Um, Amid the growing crypto adoption on the continent, uh, a number of countries in Africa have been moving to adopt digital assets. Cool. Several African countries like Cameroon, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the Republic of the Congo um, disclosed plans to adopt the TON blockchain as the cryptocurrency and blockchain to, do, uh, to drive uh, future national economic progress. Interesting. So across the board uh, in Africa, you're seeing kind of like the same sort of moves. Um, I feel like this guy is really a pioneer, though, Mr. Tuadera. You're you're doing a fantastic job. Pat on the back from me, um, <laughs> even though that means very little. Um, I'm still I'm still supremely happy about that. Uh, let's mathematics is the language of the universe. But oh, dude, I love this guy, man. Well, wow. he's he's really cool. He's really cool. Um, awesome. Manage. Okay, well, his communications team, I really like. <laughs> maybe not him, maybe not just him, but uh, I like the communications team. They're doing a good job. Now, that is that is a little bit of news about mass adoption. That's a little bit of um, kind of a spread of what the world is moving towards, right? Um, let's take a move away from um, the World Economic Forum. Let's move away from Africa as well. Um, and let's take a look at Japan. Let's take a look at Japan, right? Japan's BitBank to set up a custody firm to facilitate institutional entry to local markets. Japan is trying to bring mass adoption. <laughs> we love to see it. In a new development for East Asia, uh, this is again from Ezra, Ezra Regera, um, crypto exchange BitBank reveals plans to establish uh, JADAT, a crypto specialized custodian. Uh, in partnership with Sumimoto Mitsui Trust Holdings. So in a new development for East Asia, Japanese crypto exchange BitBank announced a partnership um, to establish the Japan Digital Asset Trust. Regulation, fellas. Regulation. Step one. Love it. According to an announcement sent to Cointelegraph on Tuesday, uh, the Digital Asset Trust of Japan will offer custodial services and auditing and wallet insurance. The company is designed to facilitate the entrance of institutional players into the Japanese digital asset market. Um, this can be good and it can be bad. Um, I think in terms of mass adoption, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. Remember guys, we talked about one of the episodes, we talked about Germany, uh, second largest bank in Germany, uh, and how they are making Bitcoin uh, investments or crypto investments more appealing uh i guess to all these old um so well um, maybe not old people but like just just more institutional uh investors right that that was the whole point of it uh it was credibility right a lot of credence uh is is given to this space uh when you see um what is effectively the second largest bank in a country um kind of take a move in that direction so here we're seeing kind of a similar thing um we're seeing a digital asset trust. And what is it that they're doing? Custodial services, auditing, and wallet insurance. That is 
security. That is security and that is regulation. Uh, once established, the firm will specialize in custody services for digital asset holdings, including cryptocurrencies, security tokens, stable coins, NFTs, the whole shebang, right? Um, BitBank is one of the largest crypto exchanges in Asia, monthly trading volume over $5 billion. Um, and the guys they partnered with, Sumitomo Mitsui Trust Holdings, uh, they're a publicly traded holding and a specialized trust bank group. So a lot of credibility, a lot of credence, bit of entrenchment too, but um, I would say, I mean, if you think about Japanese society, like there's a lot of respect for authority, right? Authority is respected quite a lot. You don't see a lot of Japanese anarchists, you know, <laughs> not, not generally. So I feel like this is a very, very, uh, it's, it's quite opportune. I feel like this might be the best way. Like if news about regulation was to come out of Japan, this is what I would want to see. This is kind of, it makes sense to me, you know, that it would move a little bit slower, move with institutional players, try to get them familiar with the space. Um, and once the men in suits um, that control things are happy with uh, Bitcoin, um, that's when society sees a big change. Um, and Japanese society kind of moves towards um, acceptance of this as a regular thing, right? Um, obviously, that is a that is an opinion from like one dude. So uh, if you feel like you agree, do let me know in the comments. If you feel like you disagree, um, just click off this video now and don't come back. No, I'm joking. Put a comment down as well if you disagree, because um, I want to see the spread of opinion. I really do. Um, so, like I said, $5 billion, uh traded and, and um, a specialized trust bank group, a lot of credibility. According to the announcement, the firms will use their expertise, their combined expertise, um, to contribute to the development of the JADOT, um, the Japan Digital Asset Trust. Um, the crypto exchange and financial holdings firm uh, have signed a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, uh, with both parties agreeing to explore the possibilities of Sumitomo Mitsui Holdings investing in the digital asset trust. Um, last week, one of Japan's largest investment banks, Nomura. Uh, amazing, I love seeing this. The One of the largest banks here is one of the largest banks in Japan, one of the largest banks in um, Germany. Like, don't get me wrong, I hate banks. I despise banks. I, I dislike them with a passion. Um, but I do like it when they, when they contribute towards mass adoption that always makes me happy makes me smile um so nomura have revealed plans to create a crypto subsidiary outside of japan following a recent move from the firm to offer btc derivatives uh to its clients across asia the new subsidiary will be focusing on helping institutions invest their funds into crypto and nfts um, earlier in May, e-commerce platform SBI Motor Japan announced that it would accept BTC. Look at that, man. It's just mass adoption across the board. So you see this digital asset trust creating security and, and, and regulation within the space. Society starts to make a bit of a change, starts to be like, yo, okay, maybe this isn't so bad. You know, let me just go, let me just uh, take a look at this. Think about this a little bit. Um, and then you look out your window and what do you see? You see um, people paying for... Um, like on, on the e-commerce platform, SBI Motor Japan, paying for things with BTC uh, and XRP. Um, you know, bear bear with me with this analogy. I know you're not going to look out your window and see an e-commerce platform running around, but um, you know what I mean. It's it's everywhere you look, um, you're seeing mass adoption moves. The biggest bank in the country um, has plans to create a crypto subsidiary. Like, dude, that's fucking huge. Uh, Japan's largest investment bank, Nomura, readies new crypto uh, subsidiary. Let's take a look at this article too. Let's take a look at this article too. Um, so this was from the 17th of May. 100 personnel to work in the digital asset space. New subsidiary company to help, again, to help institutional clients invest in cryptocurrency and NFTs. Financial Times reported on Tuesday that people with knowledge of Nomura's plans claim the firm are uh, bringing together several crypto services under a single um, kind of company banner. Uh, with a staff of about 100 people um, by next year. Wow, $569 billion in assets under management as of quarter one uh, of this year. So yeah, biggest bank in the country for sure. <laughs> um, Nikkei Asia, a Japanese news outlet, reported that the subsidiary company will be established abroad, uh, but the board will start off seated by Nomura Transplants um, while the company acquires talent in the Web3 and blockchain space. Amazing. 
that's again importance of education right um if you educate yourself in web3 skills blockchain development skills uh, or just anything within the space you could get snapped up by like google youtube these guys are going to fade into the dust in in the in the world of web3 they absolutely are um but you know big names like that and the biggest uh names in in finance in japan um as well will probably try to snap you up so you see right there you see the value um of web3 because the pain bro the salaries for these kinds of jobs are insane as well for web3 skilled uh jobs like highly skilled web3 niche positions insane absolutely insane so educate yourself because it could be the it could be kind of like the 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 catalyst for a massive change in your life um it certainly was for me um it will initially be led by jez moadine uh head of wholesale digital operations for namura amazing amazing so the reason this happened apparently is because they felt mounting pressure to become more intimately acquainted with uh blockchain technology and this burgeoning industry of digital assets um one of the executives from nomura told the financial times if we don't do this then it's going to be more difficult down the line to be competitive damn right damn right it is um and this is why you are going to see in the future in the near future the very very near future guys you are going to see every company pretty much every company um try to implement blockchain technology in some form or the other right it's going to happen you're gonna see whoever it is you work for now they're gonna introduce uh hey guys new training module blockchain technology right it's gonna happen um companies are gonna start kind of scrambling to not be left in the dust uh not having blockchain technology implemented integrated into your like the structure of your company or the structure of your operations um it's going to be a death sentence it's going to be akin to um not having a website like literally that is what's going to happen um and so but this is just the beginnings of it we are lit we, guys we are at the the precipice of the of the pump we have the best entry price right now um for this pump the move to expand crypto services comes at an interesting juncture for namura yeah that's just namura news yeah that's freaking wild that's freaking wild i love it mass adoption in the central african republic mass adoption um kind of the right push the right direction on a global scale with the world economic forum and also mass adoption in japan we love to see it we freaking love to see it man and on the subject of like what blockchain technology can do to improve our lives and just alter the fabric of human society i love that phrase i've been using it way too much um let's talk about this genomics company explores nfts in hopes of advancing precision medicine like right i'm just gonna let that sit there for a second and sink in guys they're looking at nfts to advance precision medicine gene nfts isn't that wild isn't that absolutely wild gene nfts may be a game changer for genomic testing but user education is still needed in order for this model to advance amazing it's like i've written this article myself <laughs> education uh rachel rachel wolfson is bringing us this sauce um from yesterday it is predicted that non-fungible tokens or nfts will have a vast impact on society i would say blockchain technology more than just non-fungible tokens but yeah 100 nfts too man non-fungibility that's big um given this it shouldn't come as a surprise that the trillion dollar healthcare sector uh has begun to explore nft tokens um to advance medicine it's also important to note that blockchain technology uh can play an increasingly important role within the healthcare sector uh which was highlighted recently in a report um the eu healthcare report right the eu blockchain observatory envisions distributed ledger technology delivering the healthcare 4.0 era damn they moved from web 3 to healthcare 4 <laughs> fucking hell I'm, i've missed i've missed the number um old systems new challenges fantastic wow the fight against counterfeiting you're going to stop medical fraud beautiful centralization properly served um one of our cobras artorias he's uh he's got a background in medicine right that was like his he's got a background in like medicine and medical technology i know he's probably like uh, foaming at the bit right now bro reading this article um and once we open this up to discussion i would i i'm absolutely interested in hearing um kind of the viewpoints on this but take a look at that centralization properly served 
Um, efficient centralization is hard to deliver, but not with uh, blockchain technology, right? Old system, new challenges. New system, no challenges. <laughs> Fantastic. Data safety. Um, wow, wow, all great things. Let's take a look at the conclusion. The framers of the report encourage the European Commission to facilitate future legislation enabling innovation in health information technologies, including blockchain. They underline the DLTs. Uh, what is the DLT? The. Da, 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 da. Distributed ledger technology, I think, and that's what makes sense. Yeah. Um, so they're saying they underline the DLT's potential to be not just technological infrastructure, uh, but a new way to govern data relationships, right? Not just infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure as well, sure, but also a new way to govern data relationships, everything on a smart contract, right? And a conduit for economic development. A possible threat to blockchain-powered innovation could come from legislators, of course, always, um, who could stall the technology's implementation by introducing overly conservative regulatory measures. The regulatory measures we looked at before, they didn't seem overly conservative. Remember how I said, in moderation, up to a point. Um, but I think there was a really insightful point made in one of those articles about financial clarity, regulatory clarity, excuse me, um, the roadmap. If the roadmap is there, if the roadmap is accessible, um, then that's not regulatory uh, smoke and mirrors. You know, it's not regulatory bullshit. It's regulation. <laughs> um, therefore, the report advocates for the regular view, uh, excuse me, the regular review of regulations regarding their adequacy for the newest debates and developments around uh, distributed ledger technology. Oversight of decentralized blockchain technologies requires a fresh perspective, yes, and continual education. I mean, fresh perspective, obviously. What just jumped to my mind was um, Warren Buffett, right? Like, he has so much knowledge about finance but like what what he's taught me is that wisdom uh has an expiration date too wisdom absolutely has an expiration date wisdom can fall out of touch you know experience can fall out of touch and you can be left in the dust right um so a fresh perspective is always important and continual education of um advances education and fresh perspective that comes from education um, continually update yourself on advances um, to determine how to integrate this technology into the current and future regulatory frameworks. Uh, the European Blockchain Observatory is a European Commission initiative designed to facilitate blockchain innovation. Cool, 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 cool. So it makes sense that they would take a more positive stance on this. But like, go through the article. I mean, it just makes sense if you if you think about what distributed ledger technology means and you just translate it in your head you just translate it in your head into the medical field it's it's just it's just pure bullishness you know it's just pure i don't see a single sort of negative but of course if you do um put a comment down below and then we'll explore it in the next uh the next video that we do on the news um so that was the that was the report that we just looked at um let's go back to it specifically documents how this can be yeah the healthcare industry the paper notes that patient engagement and transparency of how data is stored uh, along with the effective distribution of knowledge and data uh, remains problematic for the healthcare sector yet as blockchain space as the blockchain space continues to advance tokenization in the form of nfts may serve as a solution Gene NFTs. Let's let's take a look at what this article is actually talking about, right? Precision medicine. So for those unfamiliar with the term, uh, precision medicine is a emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention uh, that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. So it's not uh, macro medicine. It's not like a big spread of people and you do like a big uh, study and, and it's all like different sort of, it's much more controlled much more individual level, right? Each person's specific lifestyle, environment, and down to their sort of genetic makeup, right? Individual variability within their genetic makeup. Um, that's what precision medicine is kind of all about. Um, if I'm butchering this, I'm sure I'm sure I'll be corrected down <laughs> down the line. Um, 
But yeah, that's that's what precision medicine is. And the way that they're trying to kind of plug um, NFTs into this is by um, effectively tokenizing genetic profiles, right? Um, so patients maintain data ownership, right, over their own data and, and transparency into their insights uh, while receiving many benefits that are not typically associated with traditional genomic testing. Uh, I have a family friend who's a doctor who recently moved to the UK for, um, to like, I, I don't know, work as a doctor, I suppose. <laughs> um, and he was kind of blown away by all of the kind of layers, the bureaucracy, the unnecessary, you got to have a, what was the word he used? Consultant? Was it the consultant? Yeah, the consultant has all this information and then the physician has very limited access to a specific piece of information and then the next guy has just one piece of a sentence or some nonsense like chinese whispers right um call it gdpr call it whatever but i mean it it the way i see it like it doesn't seem like data protection is it's a bit of a slap in the face you know to be like hey uh your medicine uh your your medical treatment is super slow and super sluggish and you got to sit in the emergency room for 13 hours uh, bleeding out of every orifice um, because we care about your data, the protection of your data, the privacy of your data, um, and then and then Tencent is is you know owns Discord and you, you all your data is being you know beamed into <laughs> the Chinese government's sort of front office, um, and then and kind of companies uh, like governments you see them do the same thing you know um, so it's a little bit of a slap in the face that that bureaucracy exists. Um, but with blockchain technology and the tokenization of genetic profiles, we might see a move in the right direction, away from bureaucracy, away from stagnation, away from entrenchment. Um, and worse than all of those three things is when they're tied to, when they're prefaced by uh, hypocrisy, when they're hypocritical. If it's hypocritical um, bureaucracy, bro, that's even worse, right? That's even worse. Um, so he explains, Cal, uh, who is Cal? Who is Cal? Cal, 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 Cal. Aha, Tuan Cal, Genetica CEO and founder. Uh, so Tuan says that tokenizing genetic profiles can help patients maintain data ownership um, and receiving and, and, and uh, transparency into their insights while receiving many benefits that are not typically associated with traditional genomic testing. He's not talking about the medical industry as a whole. He's talking about, uh, you know, a lot of specificity here um, about the actual uh, genomic testing aspect of it. So, for example, Genetica, a genomic company catering to the Asia-Pacific region, recently partnered with Oasis Labs, a Web3 data management firm, to tokenize um, genomic profiles. Tuan Cao uh, told Cointelegraph that the goal behind this partnership is to advance precision medicine by giving patient, uh, patients data ownership and rights through gene NFTs. This may be one of the most important NFT applications in the world. Literally, we're saving lives with this, man. Um, our genetic profile is unique, and it should be represented by an NFT. Dude, that's so sick. Um, gene NFTs are the tokenized ownership of one's own genetic data. Man, can you really get any more non-fungible than your own freaking DNA, bro? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, this enables each of us to truly take control and benefit from our data contribution. This is beautiful. This is very much in the spirit of more, more in the spirit of Web3 um, than DeFi, because Web3 is all about trust verifiable read-write interactability, right? Trust verifiable. That's the key word. Um, so data contribution, make it trust verifiable. Let the people control it. Let the people um, have transparency and, and insights into it, right? Uh, so Cal says traditional genetic testing companies like 23andMe uh, rely on intermediaries to, con uh, to collect patient data for research. So users must trust centralized entities to safely store sensitive health information. This is what we do with our money on a daily basis. We trust centralized banks to safely store our sensitive money. Um, moreover, users do not receive any incentives for opting to share their data with third parties. Beautiful. Yet, tokenizing genomic data in the form of an NFT has the potential to transform this model entirely. Genetica's partnership with Oasis Labs enables users to perform a traditional genetic test and receive a custom gene NFT afterwards, 
right, which represents true ownership of their genetic profile. More importantly, Cao noted that the gene NFT holders became uh, or effectively will become the gatekeepers of their own data, meaning they must grant access to third party entities that wish to use that information. It should be like this from the get-go. It should be like this from the get-go, but it is what it is. He elaborated, a user holding a gene NFT also holds the private key for that data. If a pharmaceutical company, for instance, wants to run a genetic study, they must send a proposal for access. A user can then sign the proposal to approve access. Financial and medical benefits across the board. Um, revenue sharing, right? Users get paid when third parties request to access their data. Again, should happen from the get-go. I fucking love this piece of news. Sorry, excuse my French, but like, literally, this is this is so fantastic. This makes me really happy. Um, we are able to issue, like, isn't it so sick that people, like, ben yeah, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm gonna go on a tangent. Uh, we are able to issue these payments automatically due to blockchain technology and smart contracts, says Cal. Amazing. Uh, he believes that the medical benefits are more important or they outweigh uh, the financial incentives, right? A smart contract is leveraged every time a user participates in a genetic study um, to ensure that patients will receive treatment first if they contribute to a clinical trial. I like that. Contribute to the system, benefit from the system, right? Uh, precision medicine profiles for treatments of certain diseases based on genetic variants, um, which is how this model is ultimately advancing precision medicine. It profiles people for treatments of certain diseases uh, based on genetic variants. Right, right. So precision is important. Um, Don Song, who is the founder of Oasis Lab, spoke to Coin, uh, Cointelegraph as well, uh, talking about how gene NFTs can be viewed as data-backed NFTs. Typically, people think of NFTs as JPEGs, but data-backed NFTs combine blockchain with privacy computing to utilize certain pieces of data, right, while still complying with data usage policies uh, like the EU's data protection regulations or GDPR, uh, which is what I was talking about before. Uh, so it's still in line, still compliant, um, but still data backed and still, you know, of value uh, in that sense as well. Um, given that genomes are quintessential um, pieces of identity, right, the quintessential identity of an individual, it's critical that any platform that stores and processes genomic data provides confidentiality to the data at rest, in motion, and more importantly, in use. So where it's stored, how it's sent, and how it's implemented or used or what it's used for, right? That all needs to be secure, confidential, uh, and in the hands of the person whose identity it is um, that the data is in relation to. You know what I mean? Um, Parcel provides these capabilities. Parcel is the Oasis Network's um, privacy-preserving data governance application programming interface, the API, the privacy-preserving uh, data governance API um, to tokenize genomic profiles. Parcel provides capabilities via the use of encryption of data at rest, motion, uh, and trusted execution environments as well to maintain that data confidentiality. Um, given the size of the data, uh, because, oh boy, yeah, there's, there's like terabytes on terabytes of data in DNA. Um, enormous amounts of data, way more than a computer uh, in, in like a single strand of DNA, I think. Like, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, uh, because of the size of the data and the complexity of, of all of this, um, Song did give us the caveat of, um, you know, Parcel's use of off-chain storage um, and, and uh, off-chain kind of execution environments. Uh, which makes it possible to store genomic data and run analyses on them kind of easily without having the size be a problem. <laughs> um, Parcel also supports a policy framework that is used by data owners or individuals as owners of their genomes to specify who can and cannot use their data and for what purposes. Um, so far, holy shit, they've enabled the tokenization of 30,000 genomic profiles. Um, and the partnership with Genetica will increase this number to 100,000 and then a million, then 10 million, and the whole world is on distributed ledger technology. Um, there's a little bit more information about how the healthcare industry already uses tokenization, but unfortunately, guys, we have come to 10 o'clock in the UK, uh, which means it's time to wrap up the news segment. Um, what I will do is, obviously, this is going to be in the stream resources below, so just look down, click that little button, look at the description, you'll see a little thing that says stream resources with like a little newspaper on it, 
um, go to our Medium article. It'll have this article on it as well. Um, read through it. Read through it and, and let us know what you think. Leave a comment on the Medium itself if you want to or put something on the YouTube uh, or join us on Discord. Whatever it is that you want to do. Um, I'm, I'm interested. I want to hear your opinion. Uh, and I feel like you could really take something away from this. So it will be there. Read it in your own time. This will also um, be in the stream resources. What is total value locked uh, in crypto? And why does it matter? In the interest of educating, you know, and pushing education, um, it's important. It's important. Trust me, it's, it's, it's going to be good. So read that. Um, go through our Discord um, educational resources as well. Um, the last episode on, on YouTube was, I think, what is DeFi? Um, all of that is, is content that is on our Discord. So join up. There's a link in the description for that as well. So many links in the description. Um, come through. Uh, we'd love to have you join live. You know, it'd be sick. It'd be sick. As soon as I wrap this up, um, everyone that's in the room is going to launch into a discussion about everything that was discussed. So, like, if you'd like to be a part of that, do join. Um, we'd love to have you. But with all that said, guys, that is... Yeah, we've, we've missed out on the GameStop stuff as well. We'll look at that next time. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been your host, Dharma, Brooklyn the God, whatever you want to call me. Um, this has been another episode of Cobra News. Thank you so much for being a part of it. And I will catch you guys on the flip. Brooklyn out. Ciao, ciao.